This is God's invitation and call for a man to pursue godliness. I want to show you something. catching this It's coming from First Timothy. Seven through eight. God's invitation and call for men to pursue godliness. It's really difficult to write this way because it's it's going backwards. And uh makes me feel like I'm dealing with the Hebrews <laughs> in their in their language because their language begins uh, from right to left, whereas in our, our American language um, it's from left to right. So what we want to do today is we want to continue in our series and we're we're not gonna preach for an hour, but um, I just want to briefly remind you that uh, I, I forgot to tell you last time I was here um, after my rebuking and um, confrontation and then going into um, question number four, what is godliness? I forgot to tell you that I changed the name of, of, of our ministry from the church at Seattle to Grace um, Gospel Faith International Church. It's really long. It's grace, because of the grace of God, gospel, because of the gospel of God, faith, which is what we need, the grace of God, the gospel of God is what we need to believe in, faith is what um, we are, what God needs from us, international, that means all the nations, um, church, and so it's grace, gospel, faith, international church. Now, if I actually have a congregation that's running with me, and um, doing ministry with me, they might want to change it and shorten it to just Grace Gospel Church. Um, I don't know. But as of right now, the name of the ministry is also known as, it, when I'm in the Seattle area, it's the church at Seattle, but in, in the Portland area, it's Grace Gospel Faith International Church. And I'm the international because, you know, I'm Haitian Cuban, and so trying to do ministry in Portland on, on God's behalf. Um, it's been really difficult. I, I've preached three days in a row at three different times. On Sunday, I preached uh, Jesus to the public after I went to Mago Day Church and um, went to Bap uh, Hanson Baptist Church. They didn't receive it. I was confronted um, by a man, and he told me to stop preaching to the people because I'm driving them away from the faith. And I'm driving them away from God. Uh, the next time I, I preached was on uh, yesterday afternoon. Actually, it was on Monday afternoon. Um, I was out there with a sign that says, need, need cash. Literally, I needed cash to buy coffee because uh, I had to serve this individual. And after that, I, I felt like I needed to, to redeem myself with some coffee. I didn't have any money, so I, I put out a sign in a, this huge bucket that says, need cash. Not one penny went into the bucket. <laughs> Instead, I was insulted by the public. Um, and I, in the spirit of the Lord, just 
um, came upon me to give it back and I had to confront the American people. And uh, the verse that I began with was uh, Philippians 4.19, which, uh, my gosh, also by all your needs, but it didn't end that way. It was a pretty brutal confrontation on the fact that we in society all have needs. And when you um, when you deny someone of, of, of their livelihood, that was the word I was looking for this morning, when you deny someone of their livelihood, um, then... What happens is that it creates a need in their lives, whether it be a job, a a home, food, shelter, whatever it is. And unless you have your livelihood met, uh, it becomes a need. Well, the American people then fall for it. And so they came out, and I had to give them um, my fleshy response, which was not um, welcoming to them. They didn't appreciate that. Uh, I had somebody from city concern come and talk to me and, and was like, hey, you know, we're, we're there for you. And it's interesting because city concern was one of the first people that I signed up with to get an apartment. And every time I walked in, they told me, no, they didn't have one available. Um, I preached a third message this morning between 1.30 a.m. and 3 a.m. Uh, on uh, Southwest Salmon and, and 2nd and 3rd Avenue, basically in the middle of the night, dealing with the government on, you know, sexual assault issues and uh, being done toward me when I'm asleep. And I got to tell you, you know, that's the other reason why I'm doing this series is that God is calling men to godliness. God is not calling men to be homosexuals. God is not calling men to be perverted in the middle of the night with their mothers. God is not calling men to be perverted in, 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 in steam uh, rooms and in, in, in clubs. God is not calling men to, um, to wear high heels and makeup and uh, act like sissies. God is not calling men to, you know, get operations and remove their genitals to become women. God is not calling men to forsake their position as husbands and fathers and um, to join the, a community of sinners. God is, is calling men simply to love Him and to make Him first in their lives. And for that reason, I began this series um, Or the questions, who is the God that calls, right? And we talked about it in Acts 17, uh, 22, all the way to 31, explaining who this God is that, that that's giving us this call. What exactly is a divine calling? Um, it's a beckoning of God saying, come to me. Uh, but how do you know that he's calling? You can only know that he's calling when you hear the preaching of the word of God, when you open the scriptures um, and you read the word and you understand even though God is silent in heaven yet on earth, through the scriptures and through the preaching of the gospel and through the establishment of the church, um, God is actually calling men to salvation and repentance. Uh, the third question we asked was, who and what is man to God who calls? Who is he? Well, he is God's creation. He is God's image. That's who he is. And therefore, as God's image, he has a responsibility to respond to his creator. The fourth question that we ask is, what is godliness? And godliness is what we explained last week. Well, actually, yeah, what we explained was um, fulfilling the laws, conforming to the laws and wishes of of God. You know, being devout, pious, saintly, uh, righteous, and good. And so we come back again today, and we want to ask the question, can men truly be godly? And we're going to look at Proverbs 6, verse I believe it's verse 4, but let me, let me check here to make sure. Proverbs 6, Proverbs 6, Psalms, Proverbs, chapter 6, verse 4. Let me turn there. Why don't we go to Proverbs 6, verse 26. Proverbs 6, verse 26. It's not verse 4, it's verse 26. So why don't we begin with a word of prayer. Father, thank you for this uh, afternoon. It's Tuesday, the day after Memorial Day. And uh, Lord, um, I was able to uh, send an email today to one of the Haitian communities and to ask them for um, assistance in finding housing. And Lord, I, I pray that uh, someone will respond 
I pray, Lord God, they are a secular community, and I know that I'm taking a chance in doing this, but I put my life in your hand, and I pray, Lord God, that they will be able to assist me if they can. If not, Lord God, help me to um, find a job outside of um, outside of the ministry that I'm doing here, and that pays enough so that, uh, combined with the Social Security, I can get, um, I can find housing and, and I don't have to sleep in the streets any longer. I pray for this ministry, Lord, and I pray for those who are watching and listening, and I ask the church, Lord God, to pray with me and to pray for me for my protection, and that MacArthur and Franklin would repent of their sins, and so that we can continue to, to focus on doing the work of the ministry rather than on the sins of the MacArthur household or uh, and the sins of Gabriel Franklin, Lord God, which is constantly a stumbling block to me and always uh, a problem in wherever I go. And so, Father, I put these things at your feet and I call the men of this nation to pursue godliness and um, whatever is holding them back, especially what we're going to talk about today, briefly, that they would not, not allow it to cause them to stumble any more than it needs to. And I pray this few minutes um, that I, I talk to these men, Lord God, would be a blessing to them in Jesus' name. Amen. And so, um, if you have your Bibles, turn to Proverbs 6, verse, 20, verse 26. And here, um, this is a parental council. Proverbs, as you know, is written by uh, King Solomon, who was the king of the third king of Israel. And Solomon was born to Bathsheba. Bathsheba was the mother of Solomon. And you know the story in, in 2 Samuel, how David was on top of his roof. And um, as he was looking at, and this was during the time of war, I, I believe it was during the time of war, as the scripture says. And as he was, I guess, gazing over Jerusalem, he saw a woman bathing. This is in, in uh, 2 Samuel 11. And he saw this beautiful woman bathing. I guess her nudity was appealing to him, and um, who knows what it did to his body, but he summoned for the woman to come to him. He slept with her um, probably several times, and God allowed her to become pregnant. When he found out that she was a, a married woman, he asked for the husband to come and um, to come in and visit with his wife. In other words, you need to cover up the sin that I just committed in Israel by sleeping with your wife. I think the husband was probably well aware of what the king had done and did not approve of David's actions. And so the husband, um, wisely but yet unwisely, didn't obey the words of the king. Um, David had asked him to, to suck with him and to drink with him, which he did. And David had also asked him to, um, to go and spend some time with his wife. But because he was with some other men, he took his cot or whatever, blankets, and he slept in the courthouse of the king instead. When the king saw that Uriah the Hittite, which is the husband of Bathsheba, was not willing to go and lay with his wife, um, but he was willing to drink with the king and stay with his men, he wrote a letter um, to the commander of the army who was um, fighting for Israel at the time. And he asked that they put Uriah the Hittite in the front line of the battle so that he could be killed. Uriah took the letter from David, the king at the time, and brought the letter to um, Joab, who was the commander. And um, Joab read the letter and, uh, you know, thank you very much, and put Uriah in the front line. Not too long after that, Uriah was killed. A letter was sent back to David saying, "Your Uriah, you know, the, the fight was, the battle was very fierce. Um, the fight was terrible, and Uriah the Hittite, your servant, had, had, had been killed, along with some other men. So David um, took Bathsheba to be his wife, and the child that she conceived, the Lord killed um, to punish David for what he had done to Uriah. And so both Bathsheba and David were punished by God for the killing of Uriah the Hittite. So that was adultery and murder both done by David the king, a man after God's own heart, the player, you know, the flute player or the harpist of Israel. And so God judged David on account of the fact that he committed adultery with a woman that was not his wife. 
um, that's 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 the backdrop of how Solomon was born. After about a year or so, um, Bathsheba became pregnant again, and uh, she conceived another son, and that son is Solomon, the king, who wrote the book of Proverbs, and he was a wise and discerning man. He was given wisdom beyond his years. He was given riches and honor and glory. He was given, probably he was richer than David, wiser than David. Everything that David could have wanted to be, he was. However, um, the problem with Solomon, you know, which was, you know, slightly with David, but it escalated with Solomon. Uh, Solomon had 700 wives and 300 concubines, or is it 300 concubines? And is it 300 what? <laughs> Something like that. About a thousand women at his back. He was married to. He was sleeping with. He had over a hundred children. Solomon was a very promiscuous man. In the latter part of his life, Solomon ended up um, turning away from the Lord because of all the women who um, whom he slept with, and all of the women who he he was married to, and he made um, governmental marriages with. Uh, they were all women, probably outside of Israel, uh, women from the world who who did not receive Yahweh, who did not receive I Am, the God of the Jews, but instead had their own false gods. And so the gods and the women turned Solomon's heart away from God. And so that's basically the, the sum of, of Solomon's life. Solomon was also the king who built the first um, temple in, in Jerusalem for the Lord and um, enacted the, the Aaronic priesthood in the temple to do the sacrifices and, and all of these things. So Solomon was very, is a key figure in, in Israel, um, and he was the one who penned the book of Proverbs. Now this is what he's written. He says, my son, if you have become, if you have become surety for your neighbor, um, if you have, be my son, if you have become surety for your neighbor, have given a pledge for a stranger, if you have been snared with the words of your mouth, have been caught with the words of your mouth. Do this then, my son, and deliver yourselves, since you have come into the hand of your neighbor. Go humble yourself and importune your neighbor. Uh, give no sleep to your eyes, nor slumber to your eyelids. Deliver yourself like a gazelle from the hunter's hand, and like a bird from the hand of the fowler. Now I want you to skip down, all the way down to verse, from verse 5. To, I, I read that just so you'd have an, an idea of what was in um, in the text, but um, I want you to jump down to verse 23, um, and the scripture says this, for the commandment is a lamp, and the teaching is light, and reproof for dis dis discipline are the way of life, to keep you from evil, from the evil woman, from the smooth tongue of the adulterous woman. Do not desire her beauty in your heart, nor let her capture you with her eyelids. For on account of a harlot, one is reduced to a loaf of bread, and an adulteress hunts for the precious life. Can a man take fire in his bosom, and his clothes not be burned? Or can a man walk on hot coals, and his feet not be scorched? So is the one who goes into his neighbor's wife. Whoever touches her will not go unpunished. And uh, so you can stop reading in verse 29. So from 23 to 29, Solomon addresses the issue that his father had, but also which became his own issue, the idea of going into a woman that is not your wife. And for us, the question is, can men truly be godly? With this kind of situation, remember Adam's response to Eve, you are bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh, you shall be called woman. He was enthralled by the beauty of Eve and that he didn't have to go into the animals and treat them that way. But Eve was more than satisfactory for him to take as his wife and to have. The question is, can men truly be godly? God is calling men and inviting men to pursue godliness. How does a man pursue godliness when um, he's being pursued by a harlot? by an adulteress. Can I say the, the, the woman that I'm dealing with 
that I make mention of in my email website is an adulterous woman. Not unless I have physical contact with her face to face. But what if she's offending me when I'm asleep and doing these things? Is it still adultery? Is it still a sin? It is still a sin in the sight of God, but is it still adultery if I'm not consenting? You see, this, this, it, it, there's a fine line there. I say it's still a sin because it is two people, whether one consents and the other one does not, it is still a sin in the sight of God because God does not approve of the union. It's not a clean union. It's not a pure union. It's an unclean union in his sight. Can men truly really be godly? Not without persecution. Not without turbulence. Not without difficulty. Even David, who was king of Israel, who was known to be a man after God's own heart, could not keep himself clean when he saw the beauty of Bathsheba. And same as Solomon. Can a man take fire in his bosom and, and not be burned? Absolutely not. No man can take fire in his bosom and not be burned. If a man touches fire with his bare hands, he will burn his skin. And his mind and body will respond to the pain that fire brings to his hands. Can a man truly pursue godliness? All who desire to, to live godly shall be persecuted in Christ Jesus, says Paul. Paul answers the question to Timothy. If Timothy sought godliness and sought to, to fulfill the invitation of God, not without somebody putting a stumbling block in your way. Even your own teachers will set a stumbling block in your way and will say, wait a minute, am I not your teacher? Am I not your leader? How dare you go up before God, before me? Remember Eli and Samuel. When Eli's son were sinning, God went to Samuel, who was a boy. And God spoke to Samuel the boy and says, this is what I'm going to do to Eli's house to Eli and his sons because Eli's son have dishonored me. Automatically Samuel um, was in trouble with Eli because now Eli had a contender, a little boy. And it wasn't that Samuel was going to do anything. It's that the boy was going to replace him in the ministry where he was at because he was innocent while Samuel was guilty of allowing his sons to dishonor God. So can a man truly be godly? He can, but not without stripes. Not without being hit for it. Not without being tormented. Not without the rejection and opposition of his family. Not without the hatred of the society. Not without those who know him laughing and ridiculing at him. Even Jesus the Christ, they said, isn't that the son of Mary? And these are his brothers? Who, who is this guy? Who does he think he is? So it is with godliness. Men can truly be godly. They can be pious. They can be pure. They can be holy, according to 1 Peter 1, 15-16. Right? 1 Peter 1, 15-16, the Bible says that. Peter writes to the church in Asia Minor, and he says that God desires for us to be holy. Right? He desires for us to be pure. Be holy for I am holy, says Peter to the church. Right? Be holy for I am holy. Be ye, yeah, he says that, but like the one holy one who called you, be yourselves, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior, because it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. Imagine a pastor who wants you to be godly, more godly than he is, more holy than he is. In our generation, I'm sure there are men who fit that description or who fits that criteria of wanting others to be even more godly than he is having a close relationship with God but in times past you will find men who who take offense at young men who seeks to be godly and want nothing to do with the things of the world so men can truly be godly they can be pious, they can be pure, they can be holy, they can be unstained. James 1, 27, by the world, 100% devotion to God and Christ with no, other, with no other pursuit in life. We call those people hermits in our society. Taking on again the, the mantle of the Christian faith, the surface of the Christian faith, 
Why? Because godliness is costly. Godliness is costly. For you to stand before the entire nation as a godly figure, a person who, who prays and a person who knows his God, not only the scriptures, but he knows the spirit of God and the mind of God, and whose desire is always to do the things of God. It annoys the world. It annoys the people that are on the other side of the church. It annoys the unbelievers to know that this man is such a holy man. This woman is such a godly woman. She doesn't do that in our society. She doesn't. She's not like the harlot in um, in John eight. She's not like the the pro promiscuous mother in First Corinthians or is it Second Corinthians five, who's sleeping both with her husband and her sons and her husband's son. She's not like you know, um, not Pharaoh, but um, Potiphar's wife who's sleeping with Potiphar and Joseph. She's the opposite. Godliness is costly. The godly ceases to be, it says in Scripture. I believe it's Psalms 12, 12 1. The godly ceases to be. Psalms 12 1 says, Help, Lord, for the godly man ceases to be, for the faithful disappear from among the sons of men. There is a, a generation of men where there is no godliness anymore. No one is pursuing it. No one is pursuing to be godlike in their thinking, godlike in their character. Everyone wants to be like the world. They want to be men of the world. They want to have the characteristics of the men of the world. They want to walk like the men of the world, talk like the men of the world. They want to represent the world. You, you know, if you represent the world, then you're going to get the blessings of the world. But if you represent God, then you're going to get the blessings of God. And so the scripture says in Psalms 12, 1, the godly man ceases to be. The faithful man has disappeared. There's no more men after God's own heart. Not in past generations, nor in our generation. Why is it that God has become like a, a, a rogue? You, you, you can't reach out and touch him. You can't love him openly. You can't serve him openly. You can't tell people about him. It's almost like uh, there's something wrong with talking to people about God, associating with him. And therefore, no one pursues him. So A, godliness is costly. B, the godly one ceases to be through C, God has set apart the godly unto himself. Psalms 4, 3. Psalms 4, 3 says, But know that the Lord has set apart the godly man for himself. The Lord hears when I call to him. So if you are a godly man or a godly woman, it is because God has set you apart for himself. In other words, he wants you to be his, his priest, his minister, one who ministers to him. How does a person become godly and and become a priest to, to, unto God. Do you pray? Do you worship? Do you read the scriptures? Do you believe in your heart what the word of God is saying? Do you practice the scriptures? Are you an Ezra in your pursuit? For Ezra has said it in his heart to study the law of the Lord. Ezra has said it in his heart to do what the word of God has commanded. Ezra has said it in his heart to be godly. So the Bible says that God has set apart the godly unto himself. Number four, the godly are sincere. 2 Corinthians 1.12 The godly are sincere. They're not hypocrites. They know that they're sinners. But they also know that God is living in them and through them. So 2 Corinthians 1.12 says for our proud, for our, our proud confidence is this the testimony of our conscience that in holiness and godly sincerity not in fleshly wisdom but in the grace of God we have conducted ourselves in the world and especially toward you this is Paul writing to the church at Corinth. This is his second epistle to the church. And if you go through the letter, the two letters of, of to the Corinthian church, they're a very promiscuous group. 
Paul addresses the issue several times. The, the, the issue of, of them being sexually promiscuous and the issue of them being the temple of the living God. And of course, Paul deals with the, the whole aspect of idolatry. Of idolatry in the Corinthian church. And so these are our points. Um, A. Godly, uh, godliness is costly. B. The godly ceases to be. C. God has set apart the godly unto himself. And D. The godly are sincere, as Paul was sincere. Well, I hope that um, you understand the question and the answer. Can men truly be godly? Yes, but with a cost. With a cost. Yes, you can be a godly man, but you have to be willing to endure the cost, mm -hmm. the persecution, the rejection. Paul says to the church at Philippi that it is a privilege. Let me read, let me read you his word, and then this is our, fi our final, our final um, thought. Because I went longer than, than I wanted to this morning. Philippians, he says this. Philippians 1.29, he says, For to you it has been granted for Christ's sake not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. Who do you think he's talking to? He's talking to the godly Philippians. The church in the city of Philippi and those who desire to be godly, godlike in their thinking, in their behavior. And he's saying to them, it has been granted to you to suffer for his sake. So if you pursue godliness, if you answer this question in your life, right, this, this invitation, if you answer it, know for a fact that you're going to suffer. No matter how sincere you are. And that Satan and the world is going to persecute you. That's if you choose to go in that direction and answer God's call. Just like salvation. You answer God's call to come and be reconciled to him, he will save you. But it's costly. Anything dealing with God is costly because the world is against him. And if you stand with God, you just made yourself an enemy of the world. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this uh, few minutes um, of testimony in your word. May you help the men who seek godliness. May you help those who desire to be godly in Christ Jesus. In your name we pray.